regardless of how you see yourself and regardless of how others see you in the eyes of Jesus Christ you are worth your he sees you worth dying for amen and what matters most is that your identity is not based on what people think about you your identity is not based about what you think about yourself your identity is based on how God sees you because that is where your true identity is any understanding of your identity that is not uh, congruent with uh, God's view of you is not correct okay so usually problems and conflicts in marriage begin to arise when men expect women to think like men and women expect men to feel like women that's where usually the conflict begins that's one of the areas of conflict the other is that when men interpret a woman's trying to convince him to be more sensitive to relationships as an attempt to feminize the man that usually that concept usually stems out of our local machismo uh, way of looking at manhood because macho when you're macho you're not supposed to have any feminine traits which means you're not supposed to have any loving traits forgiving traits you should not have not have compassion because they're all feminine you have to be tough you have to be cruel and you'll have just to do what it takes to prove to the world you're not a homosexual yes okay but Jesus had all those feminine qualities showing that it is part of manhood to be like Christ is to be perfect in performance that is the man's uh, primary pr uh, orientation but perfect also in relationship that is the female's primary orientation in life is relationships because Jesus said it is finished right perfect performance but he was also perfect in relationships he gave his life for you sacrificed himself for you no greater love has man than this and he laid down his life for his friends perfect in relationship you understand that <clears throat> that's why the ideal of manhood is the combination of all the qualities found in Jesus Christ that is what real manhood is all about so a real man knows when to weep right do you think Jesus only wept once you should read Hebrews 7 you'll be surprised Jesus many times would cry out to God with loud cries and tears especially in the Garden of Gethsemane so we're talking about gender roles and gender differences so let me review what is the predominant orientation of women by God's design they are primarily relational beings How about men they are primarily performance beings okay that's why uh, it will take longer for the man to appreciate the greater value of relationships over performance because their main orientation is to perform you understand that and sometimes the women also will take some time for them to understand why for a man performance is so important okay and that's why as a wife it will help you help bring out the best in your husband if you're very supportive about him becoming successful in what he does because that is going to make him feel that you really love him you understand that because you're supporting his need to find fulfillment in what he does you understand that okay okay so also another question uh, men what is the number one need of a relational being like a woman that should be something memorized what is the number one need of a woman as a relational being hmm? I'm asking the two men here what oh that's part of it but what's the essence that they're looking for you didn't get it the number one need of every woman is the big a attention if you can give lots of that you make a woman feel really loved you understand that I mentioned to you that there was a survey in the States involving 53,000 women interviewed with the one question what is your most admired trait in men and what's number one hmm? what was number one thoughtfulness why because thoughtfulness assures a woman of the man's constant attention you understand that okay so attention amen so it's shown by listening 
by your words, by your look, and by your touch. Okay? So, I hope you did some application of that with your wife this week. Did you? Okay, because your application of the things we're learning is very important to uh, finishing this course. Because we're not just here just to learn things with our mind. We want this to shape our lives. Understand that? Okay, so I hope the men will be giving more attention. Second need is affection, right? Affection means what? Look, word, and touch. Very important. Okay, and then the th third is affirmation. Be very generous in affirming your wife. Okay? Pasalamat ka dun sa masarap na kape na tinimpla niya. Sa masarap na ulam na niluto. That means a lot to a woman. Just to hear those words. Appreciation. Affirmation. Sabi mo, ang ganda-ganda mo. Ano na, kasakit na kayo na maraming babae. Titingnan mo sa sama, sabi mo, alam mo, ikaw pa rin pinakamaganda sa akin. Okay? For the men, for the women, learn to respect your husband more and stop becoming your husband's worst critic because it doesn't help your husband at all. Just pulls him down. Okay? So I hope you learn a lot from that. You're not able to give more examples. So tonight, I hope you'll be able to spend more time. Okay, today we're going to talk, be talking about identity and blessing because it is at the very heart of a fulfilled family. Once you understand why, what identity, what is the place of identity and blessing in the family, and you will understand better why Filipino culture is what it is today. Okay? So, in, the, in creation, God gave man two important gifts. Number one is the gift of identity. Okay? How do we, where do we find that? Genesis 1, 26 to 27. God made man in his own image. Okay? So he gave man with a sense of identity where he feels and he knows that he is like God. Not God, like God. Okay? In many ways. And so God created man to be like him because God wants to fellowship with man. You see, God did not create the animals to be like the man because God's intention was not to have the man fellowship with the animals. Understand that? That's why God had to create a woman just like him, another created being, so he can really fellowship with her. Okay? So God created us for fellowship with him, and God created man for fellowship with another. In other words, from the very beginning, the most important thing to God is that relationship is the means to finding fulfillment as a human being. That's where we get our deepest fulfillment in loving and meaningful relationship with another. Okay? But our identity, like God, also meant, remember, in our first session, that man was created by God to be his, the agent of his rule and his will on earth. That's identity. Take a look at Psalm chapter 9. Could you please go there for a while? Psalm chapter 9. Can somebody read that for us? See, the gift of identity is the first gift of God to man. To know who you are in God's eyes is everything. Okay? Psalm chapter 9, what does it say? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Why? Why does the psalmist talk about the majesty of God? Because it's about to relate the majesty of God to man's worth. Okay? God is so majestic. And yet, what does it say? Okay? You have set your glory above the heavens. And then we go to, when I, I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Did you hear that? What kind of identity did God give us? You were created in his image in order to reflect his glory and his honor on earth. We were God's display window of His glory and honor. Wow. God did not do that to the angels. 
God did not place all the created order on earth under angelic authority. God placed all the created things on earth under man's authority. Place all things, you have made him ruler over the works of your hands, and you put everything under his feet. Wow. Amen? That's how special you are to God. So can you say to the person beside you, you are crowned with glory and honor. Okay, so where's the crown now? <laughs> crowned with glory and honor. And somehow we lost that after the fall, right? Right? And then Hebrews chapter 2 reminds us that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels just like us and now crowned with glory and honor in the heavenlies in order to represent us before God. So Jesus Christ became like us, became lower than the angels at one point in time in his incarnation, died for our sins so that the sins that are separated us from God will be dealt with and the justice and the holiness of God satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ so that Christ now can reconcile us with God and restore to us the glory and honor we once had before we sinned. Jesus Christ, as our representative, died your death, and now he is crowned with glory and honor, according to Hebrews 2, at the right hand of God, and that glory and honor that belongs to Jesus is yours in Christ. Okay, that's why in Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verse 6, we were raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The glory and honor that Jesus now receives from the Father is the glory and honor that is yours because you are in Christ. God again crowns you with glory and honor in Christ. You now again enjoy the privilege of sharing in the glory and honor of God. Do you understand that today? Okay? I don't even say here, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, let's not try to be brainy here. <laughs> let's, more, let's more respond to God more from the heart. Because the Word of God was not intended to educate alone. The Word of God was intended to lead us to worship God. That's why we study the Word. Because He wants us to worship Him. Amen? So, when you begin to understand, wow, thank you, Lord. That's when you begin to possess the truth. That's when it begins to impact your life. Because faith is the hand that takes the truth of God and allows the truth now to touch your life. It takes faith to do that. You can know the truth at a distance, but it doesn't change your life. It's one thing by faith to say, this is mine, thank you, Jesus. And it affects your life. You understand that? So when you hear something wonderful, what the Word of God says, wow, thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay? So I'm not trying to teach you to be charismatic or Pentecostal or whatever. I'm just teaching you to respond to God like me when we hear a truth of God that's really awesome. And that is God's gift to us, identity. You are crowned with glory and honor in Christ today. Amen? I know what that means. There's another one, Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Remember in the, in the Garden of Eden, God, when God created them and he said, Subdue the earth, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the earth, the beasts of the field, and over everything that creeps on the ground that includes the what? The serpent. The problem with the man, he failed to rule the serpent. He was ruled by the serpent because he submitted to the word of the serpent rather than to the word of God. And since that time, the serpent has taken rulership. I remember Cain, when he was being tempted, he said, sin is inside of you like a serpent coiling to dominate you. But you must rule. Again, he failed to rule. You understand that? Okay? What man lost in creation, his authority over the serpent. Listen to this. God is restoring to us in Christ. You hear that? My God, the God of peace, will soon crush Satan under whose feet? Under whose feet will God crush Satan? Everything that God, Jesus did, He did for you. Everything He did was for you. He came to restore back the glory you had before man's sin. He came to give you back your crown of glory and honor. Hebrews 2. And He comes back to restore your authority over the serpent. Now, He will crush Satan under your feet because that was supposed to be the original feet that you have stepped on Him. Is that identity? 
That's who you are in God's eyes. Okay? The devil's place in your life is under your feet, not at your back. Kasi parang tuko yan eh. Pinapayagan natin kung makapit sa atin kasi naniniwala tayo sa mga kasinungalingan niya. Every time you believe the lie of Satan, you allow the devil to take control. His job, his role, his part, his, his place is under your feet, not on your back. You know, I remember one of our members of our church has a daughter at the age of eight demonstrates such tremendous faith in God. It is always this eight-year-old who encourages the parents when they are discouraged. Mama, don't worry. Jesus will handle that. Papa, you have that pain. Jesus is going to heal it. See, tomorrow you'll be okay. Having faith. And then they were ministering to a sister who was going through a lot of problems with demonic attacks. And the sister, he, she, she shared about how the devil reminded her of her sins and her past. And when she said that, this little girl was there. And she said, Tita, age your older. When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. And this, you know, sister of ours, ah, where did you get that? I don't know, Tita, it just came to my mind. Revelation from God. When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of your, his future. Because that is so true. Your past is past. You're now a new creation. Okay? So don't allow the devil to uh, resurrect the dead that God has already buried. You've been buried in Christ. All your past, all those things have been covered by the blood. Amen? And once you seek forgiveness, that's covered by the blood. The devil likes to resurrect those things, to accuse you and condemn you. But those are all lies because God has already forgiven you. And many of us allow the devil to hang on our backs because we believe his lies. God doesn't like, love you anymore. God hates you. God has given it up to you. You're just too much. You'll never change. You have no future. You're never going to change. You'll just be like that for the rest of your life. You're hopeless. Nobody loves you. How many of you hear, hear that from time to time? Those litanies of accusations. How have you hear that in your mind from time to time? Okay? Whenever the devil speaks to you that way, tell the devil, okay? This is what you say to the devil. Look, Satan, stop talking to me about yourself. Everything you say about me, against me, is true of you, but no longer true of me. I am redeemed. I am destined to sit on the throne with Christ. I am heaven-bound. You are hell-bound. Everything you're saying, wala kang pag-asa, wala nagmamahal sa'yo, wala kang, hindi ka na pwedeng patawarin ng Diyos, you're, you know, God is angry with you. All of that is true of you, okay? Stop including me. Okay? Because that's, true, that's not true about me anymore. Because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Your identity will always be under attack. Your identity was the first gift of God to you, and that was also the first gift that the devil stole. God made man ruler over all the works of his sons. When he submitted to the devil, the rulership turned over to the Satan. That's why Jesus, uh, Satan said on the uh, mountain of temptation, he showed him all the kingdoms of this world. Look for Matthew 4. All these kingdoms have been handed over to me, and I give them to whomever I wish. Bow down before me if you want me to give them to you. Satan said, all these kingdoms, all humanity was turned over to me. Remember, we discussed this in the first session. Who turned over all the kingdoms of humanity to Satan? Adam. God will never give his property to the devil. God entrusted the dominion to Satan, uh, to, to man. And man, by bowing to the serpent, turned over his rulership to Satan. That's why Satan is called by Christ the ruler of this world, the prince of this world, because of Adam's decision. Jesus came to grab that back, that position of authority, that identity, as being the agent of God's children that was touched back by Christ from the devil for you. So now you can stand on that identity again. Do you understand what this is? The first thing the devil stole from man was his identity. And you know why? Because the devil knows if he can damage your identity, he can cripple your destiny. If he can damage your identity, he can cripple your destiny. Okay, let's go back. 
So identity was God's first gift to man. Can you say, thank you, Lord? Because of Jesus, I'm once again crowned with glory and honor. You want to see the scripture in Hebrews? Okay, I just want you to be sure that you have not scripture to speak against the enemy, the big liar, who always capitalizes on our ignorance or a lack of faith in God's word. Okay, let's go to Hebrews 2. I don't want you to miss that. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Sorry, maliit. Basa natin. Okay. Let's try 12. In the, incarna in the incarnation, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels because he identified with us. You understand that? Okay. Now, after his death on the cross, has been exalted to the right hand of God, crowned with glory and honor. Remember those words? Where did that came from? Where did these words came from? Psalm chapter 8. These were originally speaking of men. Right? But man lost that glory and honor. He fell not only lower than the angels, he fell lower than the serpent because of his sin. And now Jesus Christ takes our place, becomes our substitute, our representative, obeys the law, fulfills the whole law on our behalf because we failed the law. And dies on the cross to pay for all our sins against God's uh, law and God's holiness so that now we can be forgiven. And now snatches back the glory and honor we lost upon himself so that in Christ you are now crowned with glory and honor. In him. And in him you will crush the devil's head one day. In Christ. You understand that? This is your true identity. Whatever the devil puts in your mind that's, a, that's in contradiction to this are all lies. You understand that, okay? In bringing, he said, in bringing many sons to glory, what is his goal for all of us? He's to bring us to glory. Where he is. It was fitting that God, for whom through and everything exists, should make the author of their salvation, that's Jesus, Archegos, in, in Greek, Archegos of our salvation, perfect through suffering. Archegos authors the one who goes ahead of us on our behalf in order to clear the path for us. The word author there is the Greek, Greek word archegos, somebody, a trailblazer who goes ahead, clears the path so that we can pass on the same ground that he passed through. Now cleared of all the obstacles. That's the archegos. That's the author of our salvation. Perfect through suffering. Perfect in the sense that holy through suffering. Because perfection in the book of Hebrews is about being holy before God. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Does Jesus and you belong to one family? And listen to this. So Jesus is not ashamed of you. God has removed your shame forever in Christ. All your shame, Jesus took it with him on the cross. That's why now that you belong to Christ, he is not ashamed to call them your brothers and sisters, even though we still fall into sin because you trusted in Christ. He'll never be ashamed of you. Because his blood always cleanses you from your sins. You understand that? That's why so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers or sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. Wow. And everywhere we worship, Jesus wants to be there. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises of God together with my brothers and sisters. And that's you and me. That's identity. You understand that God restored your original identity and gave you a greater, a greater worth and value than man had before he fell. Because now, because in the eyes of Jesus, he saw your worth dying for. Will you exchange straw for gold? Will you exchange straw for gold? No, why not? Because there's no equal value. Right? But for God the Father to exchange His Son Jesus for you, what does that mean? Your worth is equal to the worth of His own Son. That's your identity. That's the true identity that you have in God's eyes. Whatever the devil says against that is a lie. Okay? Now you'll see how Satan damaged our identity 
as a Filipino people. Because the devil knows if he can damage your identity, he can cripple your destiny forever. And we'll see how that works. Okay? First gift of God is identity. The second gift of God in creation is, can you guess? Is there already in your outline? Okay. Blessing. What do you mean by blessing? And we'll see that in a little while. See, after God creates man in his own image, verse 26 to 27, 28, and God blessed them. Now, that is very important. Identity and then blessing. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground, including the serpent. Okay? But that's where man forgot. Serpent's coming. Rule. He says to Cain, rule. He didn't rule. So the serpent rules. Until Jesus came. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, so you see the word bless is very much uh, uh, connected with the idea of being fruitful and increasing in number. Because this is not the first time that the word bless appears in Genesis chapter 1. The first time that it appears in Genesis is when he blesses the birds and the fish. Can you locate the verse for me? Genesis 1. The first time the word bless appear is in reference to the birds and the fish. He said, he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply the same. So what did he say there? Can you find the verse? In day five, uh, sorry, day five of Fifth day. And God bless. What verse? 22. So what does it say? God bless what? Them, the birds and the fish. And he said, you see, the word bless is connected with the idea of being fruitful and increased because that's exactly what he says also to the man. It is that God is imparting the ability to be fruitful, multiply, to increase. And we'll see that in a little while. You see, the word bless in this sense is to empower something or someone to fulfill God's intention and design for you. Okay? The first part of blessing is identity. Identity itself is a blessing from God. Identity is God affirming your worth, affirming your dignity, affirming your significance. That's the first part of blessing. I'll see that in a little while. Okay? So these are the two gifts of God at creation. Exactly the very two things that were threatened after the fall because of man's sin. Okay? So let's take a look. Okay. God now, you know, man sinned, Genesis chapter 3, and after that, the curse spread throughout mankind. After man sinned, God cursed what? The ground. Making it hard for the performer to eat his bread. God struck man at his most vulnerable point as a performer. Because as a worker, his desire is to succeed in bringing out fruit from the ground. That's why he was created, to work the ground. And the goal of that is to make the ground bountiful and fruitful, right? And so when God cursed the ground, he was hitting at the very core of man's design. He's saying, I created you to work and to perform in order to produce. Now I'm going to make that very difficult for you. You understand that? And how about the woman? God curses the womb. God said to the man, in painful toil, you will eat your bread. To the one who says, in painful toil, you will bring forth children. Caring now is not going to be that easy. Caring, the mother instinct, the, the woman's you know, orientation to relate, to show love and care, is not be very easy anymore. Because you will experience pain understand that okay at the very core of woman's design and so those two were affected by the fall because of God's judgment you understand that and the third part of divine judgment is the curse human life you are dust and to dust you are to return so the three things the curse womb the curse ground and death those three things now in the call of Abraham you know chapter 12 of Genesis 
is the turning point of history from God's point of view. Genesis 12, or the call of Abraham, is the turning point of history as from God's point of view. Why? Because whereas from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, the movement was from blessing at creation to the curse. Understand that? From Genesis 12 onwards, the movement now is starting with the context of the curse. God moves now to restore blessing to the world through Abraham. You see the movements there? Genesis 1 to 11, blessing, moving to the curse. Genesis 12 and onwards, God now starts in the context of curse and moves towards restoring blessing to man through Abraham. You understand that? Okay? So, why do we say that the call of Abraham started with a curse? Because if you go to Genesis 11, the last five verses of Genesis 11, you will discover that just before God called Abraham, three things were mentioned. Number one, that his brother Nahor dies. Okay? And later on, his father Terah dies. Reminds you of what? In the judgment of Genesis 3, the curse of death. Right? And then it's mentioned that Sarah is barren. Reminds you of what? The curse of the womb. And then thirdly, when they get into the land, if you go to verse 10, there was famine in the land. Curse ground. See those three. See, the story of Abraham begins in the context of the curse. The curse of death, the cursed, the cursed womb, his wife, his own wife, was barren. And the cursed ground, famine, hits the land when they arrive there, according to verse 10. Now there's of Genesis 12. So the promises of God started in the context of the curse, and you notice everything is, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, moving towards the blessing. That's why Genesis 12, according to Jewish scholars, is the hinge upon which history turns from bless, curse to blessing. And the blessing was going to be restored to humanity through Abraham. That's why he was called. And I will make of you a great nation. What is that? Identity. And I will bless you. Blessing. And make your name great? Identity. And so that you and so so that you'll be a blessing and blessing. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God is saying, I just threatened the blessing I gave man after he fell, but now I'm going to return that blessing through you, Abraham. In you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you think you're one of them? Do you think you're one of those? Notice the context of God's promise. In you, he didn't say, in you, all the individuals on the earth shall be blessed. That's not what he said. The word here in Hebrew is mishpaka, which refers to the family. That's why the ASP gives us a very good translation. Others is peoples, but never nations, because that is found in another chapter, in Genesis chapter 22, where God reiterates his promise, and there he may use the word nations. Okay? But here it's families. Do you understand that? So God's purpose was that the blessing will be restored back to man through Abraham, the father of faith, and to his descendants, and we will see in Galatians, Abraham has physical descendants. He also has spiritual descendants, and that's us. Do you understand that? Galatians chapter 3. And so, God is to restore the blessings to mankind through Abraham, but the context through which that blessing will be restored is through families. Families. Because the curse started with a family. Adam's family. The blessings of God will be restored through the family. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay? Here, the author could have used the word for nations, goyim, but he did not use that. He used the word mishpaka, which means the family. So all families of the earth shall be blessed. How is that going to happen? Will the transference of the blessing from Abraham to generation to come purely automatic, just because you're a son of Abraham, therefore you inherit the blessings? That's a very important question. 
How is the blessing transmitted? From Abraham, down, 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 to the next generations. Okay? So we'll see that in a little while. Okay. Let's define what blessing is based on the Old Testament. See, the word blessing has two aspects. The first meaning has something to do with affirmation. Blessing means to affirm the worth or identity of another or to honor. The word to honor uh, is, has, is um, almost synonymous in meeting with the word to bless. That's why you say, I bless you, Lord, which means I honor you, Lord. You understand that? To bless, to honor are synonymous. Okay, so to bless, first of all, in the sense of affirmation means to affirm your worth and identity. Anything that you say that affirms the worth or identity of a person is a word of blessing. I like to say, I love you, that's blessing because you're affirming the worth of the person. You're saying, uh, you're a great cook, uh, you're beautiful, you're great, you did well. Congratulations. All these words affirm the worth of a person. Those are words of blessing. That's why we bless God with our mouth. We thank Him. We praise Him. We extol His attributes. We begin to focus on what He has done. That's what you mean when you bless God. You affirm His dignity and worth for who He is and what He has done. So when you mention to the person, you're great, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you're affirming the person, you're blessing the person. You understand that? Okay? So when you thank Him for what He has done, you are blessing the person as you bless God by thanking Him for what He has done. So blessing can refer to the, uh, to the uh, person and to what He has done. Anything positive you say to affirm the person's worth because of who He is and what He has done is the meaning of the word to bless. That's the first meaning. To affirm. You understand that? So pag sinabi kong you're a great writer. That's a word of blessing. Okay? So when I say, you've got a, you, you know, your dress is awesome. That's a word of blessing. Or you say, your eyes are beautiful. That's a word of blessing. Thank you for the coffee, sweetheart. That's a word of blessing. Anything that affirms the worth of another, according to the Bible, is to bless. So, if you say, I bless you, what do you mean? Be more specific. In what sense do you bless me? How, in what sense do you affirm me? You understand that? That's the first meaning of blessing, is to affirm. The second meaning, as we have found in Genesis 1, is to impartation. When God blesses you as an action, the first impartation is blessing by words. The second meaning of blessing is shown through action. When God blesses you, He's going to empower you to succeed, prosper, multiply, to empower another to successfully fulfill his or her unique purpose and potentials given by God. Like the birds and the fish, He created the birds and the fish with tremendous potential for multiplication. You can just imagine the tremendous uh, capacity of fish to multiply. Right? In one pagalanak, you're talking about how many eggs? Birds, how many eggs? That's why we eat chicken's egg because there's so many chicken eggs. Because one chicken can bear many eggs at a time. The capacity to multiply is awesome. And when God blessed and said, I want you to fulfill that purpose and design. I empower you. Multiply and be fruitful. You understand that? So the second meaning of the bless is God empowering you to fulfill your God-given purpose and design and the potentials that God has put into you. That is the second meaning of the bless. That is the idea of impartation. God is imparting, imparting power to you to for, succeed, to succeed in God's purpose for you. You understand that? So understand what blessing means, according to the Old Testament. Okay? The first definition refers to one's identity. When God affirms you, that's identity. When God imparts power to you, that is intended to help you fulfill your God-given destiny. So the first meaning of blessing has something to do with your identity. The second meaning of blessing has something to do with your destiny. God blesses you with both. 
Amen? I will see more how that works out. Identity answers the question, who am I? If I was going to give you an exercise where you want you to draw anything from creation, animal, plants, whatever, that fitly describes how you see yourself, what would you draw? What are you to you? Who are you? How, to what in creation would you compare how you see yourself? Anyone would like to try? Who are you in your own eyes? To what can you compare yourself? After some quality that you have or some experience you went through, you can use that to compare yourself to something in the created order, plants, animals. Somebody said, Pastor, I look like a worm. So I see myself. But you know what? Thank God the worm can become a butterfly. <laughs> Bumawi. <laughs> That's how I despise myself. I feel like I'm a worm. So how do you see yourself? To what will you compare yourself? So another lady told me, Pastor, I'm like a flower that's beginning to fade away. <laughs> Why? I'm already 35. I still don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> a flower that's fading away. <laughs> that's how she sees herself. So I don't know how you see yourself today. Another. How would you compare how you look at life? Do you see life as a battlefield? Do you see life like a struggle, a battlefield, survival of the fittest? Do you see life as a great university? That means you're hungry to learn from every experience of life. Every experience to you is a lesson that will help you grow in understanding, becoming more mature. That's why I see life primarily as a university. I say I'm not scared about criticism because I want to learn. I want to understand life. If you look at life as a battlefield, that means you're always struggling. It's quite a negative view of life. See it as a battlefield. That means you're really trying to survive. And that shows how you look at yourself. You tend to look down on yourself too much. Okay? So how do you see yourself? Okay? You see, how you see yourself is often determined by how others see you, right? Who told you were like that? Your mom, your dad, your kuya, your ate. Who told you, oh, you're like this, you're like this, you're like that. And you begin to believe they're right. So, plada, maldita, etc., and all those things. Walang alam. Or, magaling na singer. Or, bihira tayo mapuri sa bahay. Yan ang problem eh. Uh, the home is the, uh, is the place where you cannot really uh, know your identity at all. <laughs> we'll learn more about that. Okay, destiny. What was I meant to become? From where I am to what I was meant to become is the biggest challenge of life. What was I meant to be? That's your destiny. Okay? What God meant you to become later on because of your God-given gifts and potentials. That's your destiny. Okay? So God affirms your identity and empowers you in your destiny. That's your blessing from God in Christ. Amen? How we see ourselves, our identity affects our performance, relationships, and ultimately our destiny. Do you agree? If you see yourself as a poor performer, the more you will perform poor, poorly. Because that's how you see yourself. If you see yourself as a very talented person, it will show. 
If you see yourself as an inferior person, you will tend to feel insecure when you come in contact with people with, name, with a name or with reputation, mga VIPs. You feel insecure because you look down on yourself. You understand that? When you look down on yourself, you think that others look down also on you. True or false? You see, how you perceive yourself affects your performance and your relationships because you'll always become suspicious of people. Especially those you don't know enough and they're frowning at you or they're not talking to you. You begin to think, maybe they're thinking about me the way I think about myself. That's why it is said, the guilty run even when there's no one chasing. Because when you're guilty, you tend to think that everybody thinks you're guilty. And so you try to avoid, you know, because that's how you see yourself. Right? If you see yourself as a failure, you'll never succeed in anything because it will affect your performance. It will affect your relationship with people. You'll be sensitive to criticism because you're never a failure. I don't want more criticism. A person who constantly looks down on himself will find it very difficult to, to handle criticism. Why? Because your tendency is to protect yourself from more degradation. And so criticism is something you don't want, you don't want to handle it. It affects you too much because it's like adding to your low view of yourself, you don't want any more of that. You're filled with that already. You become now to be hostile and resistant. Diba? What do you feel towards a person who criticizes you? Do you feel very loving towards the person? Or do you feel hostile? Why do you feel hostile? Because you're now in a protective mode. You're trying to protect yourself. From what? From what? From more degradation. Why? Because you already degrade yourself in the first place. But if you know who you are and you know your, your true worth, it doesn't affect you because you know who you are. You can take it that, okay, okay, that's what you think, okay. But you're not much happy because you know yourself. You know your true worth. You know who you are. You're confident about who you are. But if you're not confident about yourself, you tend to look down yourself, criticism will really affect you negatively. It's going to hurt because it's just adding to the degradation of yourself that you started on yourself. Do you see how, you're, how you view yourself affects your relationships? That's why if you always criticize yourself and look down on yourself, you will tend also to be very critical of other people because unconsciously you find consolation in thinking, pareho lang naman kami. Make, to make want to make it look na pareho lang tayo so critical ka rin kasi doon ka nakaka console ng sarili mo kasi critical ka sa sarili mo eh. true or false when you cannot accept yourself as you are you find it hard to accept anyone as they are if you cannot forgive yourself you'll find it very hard to forgive others when you hate yourself, it's easy to hate people who look like you. Ask yourself, is that true? So what are you re realizing tonight? How you see yourself affects everything. That is your identity. That's why when a man and a woman gets married and they're both insecure and they look down on themselves, I'm going to prepare them for a lot of battles ahead. When a man and woman gets married and they both look down on themselves too much, there will be a lot of battles ahead. You know why? Because there will always be a tendency to protect oneself. And when you're concerned about protecting yourself, you spend too much energy trying to protect yourself, you have little energy left to love the person. Because you're more conscious about what is thinking about me, what is saying about me, you know. That preoccupies you too much, no more energy left, no more energy left to love the person. 
You're more focused on defending yourself, protecting yourself. Because you're already damaged. You have not healed yet. And your spouse maybe is going through the same thing. And so he's also be sensitive with, about you. Think about that. Is that going on in your marriage right now? You're always sensitive about your husband, things about you? Are you so dependent on him for how you see yourself? Okay? Makamaling salita lang, away. Right? Because you are depending on your husband for your worth. And your husband is not giving that much to you, so you feel so frustrated. Because you're not confident about yourself enough. Okay? Identity affects everything in your life. That's why Anais Nin, a writer, U.S. writer, said, We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. Anais Nin. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. Everything goes through a grid. And that grid of how you interpret events around you and people will always be dependent on how you look at yourself. Okay? Next. You see, blessing or affirmation, affirming a person, empowers us to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. While on the other hand, cursing, and we will define cursing very soon, cripples us from fulfilling God's purpose in our lives. You see, when you are blessed or honored, affirmed by another, it empowers you in three ways. It affirms your sense of self-worth and belongingness, and thereby enabling us to accept, appreciate, and respect ourselves, right? Can you love yourself if nobody loves you? Can you accept yourself if everybody else around you rejects you? Can you accept yourself when everybody else around you rejects you? Very hard. Very hard. Can you respect yourself when everybody does not respect you? But when somebody affirms you, wow, it makes you feel worth. If somebody shows that I respect you in spite of everything, that gives you the power to respect yourself too. Somebody says, you know, I accept you just as you are. You don't have to hate yourself because I accept you just as you are. And that empowers you to accept yourself. You understand that? Okay? That is why when we are blessing somebody, when affirming somebody, we are empowering that person. Okay? Next. Blessing or honor builds confidence in our capacity for doing because somebody affirms us, you can do it, I know you can. You have all the gift. Does that encourage you to do better? Or does that discourage you? <laughs> you can do it, we're behind you. You have all the potential for that. Come on, do it. I believe in you. Wow. How many of you have heard somebody say, I believe in you? Very rarely do you hear that, right? Because we live in a culture that's not very affirming, rather degrading. And that's Filipino culture. Okay? Because, you rin naranasan mo sa bahay, kayo rin ginagawa mo. Generational na yan. Generational. We are a culture of cursed identities. Okay, number three. When you're blessed or affirmed and honored by a person, it helps release your potentials as it gives you confidence in overcoming barriers and challenges in relationships and performance because somebody makes you believe you can do it because he believes in you. Right? Instead of saying to your husband, You know, ang kalimutin mo talaga, wala ka na pag-asa, talagang ganyan ka na. Curse yun. Yung sabihin mo, alam mo mahal, I believe you can, you can develop that habit of remembering. I believe in you. You can do it. Mas maganda yun, di ba? Mas nakaka-encourage. Pero as Filipinos kasi, sanay tayo sa degrading language. Bakit tayo dun eh? True or false? 
Mas madali mo mapansin yung negative sa tao kaysa yung maganda. Totoo hindi. Kaya sabi nga natin, pag lagi ka takanigin sa pangit, kaya ka pumapangit. Pati relasyon mag pumapangit. Kasi lagi nakatingin sa pangit. Ano mapapala mo sa pangit? Pangit din. <laughs> Kapangit. Pero lagi mo na yung maganda sa asawa mo, maganda sa anak mo, maganda sa magulang mo, hanapin mo yung maganda. Nakangiti ka lagi. Yung maganda ka rin. If I told you, the greatest beautifier of a woman or any person is not cosmetics, but a smile. Alam mo, kahit wala kang cosmetic, ngumiti kang ganda mo. Try it right now. Can you look at the person beside you and smile? Ang gano'n, gumaganda kayo lahat, oh. Nagmagwapo, eh, mga guys, oh. Pag naka-smile, design ng Diyos yan, eh. Walang cosmetic ang kukumpara sa ganda ng ngiti. Kasi kahit ang kapal na mukha mo ng cosmetic, nakasimangot ka, pangit ka pa rin. Sorry, ah. Totoo lang yun. Ang ganda pa ng cosmetic mo, naka-thick eyelashes, naka-itim na itim na yung mata mo sa, sa kapal ng ano. Pag sumimangot ka, naku, sayang lahat ng cosmetic. True or false? Hmm. Ngitiyan mo kasi lagi asawa mo pag nainis ka. Namimistify mo yung asawa mo. Mapapaisip mo yun. Ano nangyayari sa asawa ko? <laughs> Kasi alam mo, you're trying always to convince your husband, di ba, by so many words. Hindi man umuubra eh. Tumahimik ka, mapapaisip lalo yun. Mas powerful yung silence kaysa words. Tips for wives. Okay, you got this? Okay. I'm going slow, ah. Huh? Here's one example. When Pic you know Pablo Picasso? You've seen his work? Awesome guy. Very versatile. It is art. When asked about the secret of his greatness, the great painter Pablo Picasso replied, Do you want to know the secret of his greatness? Anyone who wants to be great for God? My goodness, we were all destined by God for greatness. We were meant to become like Jesus. This greatness. Jesus isn't great to you? He's not the greatest person in the universe to you? He is. You were meant to be like him. You were destined to be great. Right? This is what he said. When I was a child, my mother said to me, Son, if you become a soldier, you will surely become a general. If you become a monk, you will surely end up as the Pope. I became a painter and I end up as a Picasso. So according to Pablo Picasso, what was the secret of his greatness? Come on, tell me. What was the secret of Picasso's greatness according to him? The constant affirmation and blessing of a mother. That's the power of blessing. That's the power of affirmation. Right? Ding. Hello, are you still here? That's the power of affirmation or blessing. Instead of Saying to your child, ikaw talaga bobo ka, wala wala wala, puro nega negative. Magiging ganun nga yung anak mo one day. Yung kasi yung ginawa, binigay mong i-release mo sa kanya eh. Anak, you can all get over that. Kaya mo yan. And one day anak, I'll be proud of you. I know I will. Because I know what God put in you. You'll be a great writer. I see your potential. You'll be a great artist one day, son. I'll be your first admirer. That's what I did to my daughter, Shiriel. She started with just drawings, drawings. I said, wow, you know. Uh, I said, Ama, look at this. Wow, that's even better. Wow, you're improving, you know. All throughout her growing years, I decided to be my children's greatest admirer rather than become my children's worst critic. That's what, what most parents are in our culture. And because of that, now my daughter is a great uh, artist, digital artist, animator, art. She touches, picks up a piece of sand from the seashore, transforms it a beautiful card. Takes a little leaf, transforms it a beautiful piece of art. 
She's a real artist. I've never seen anyone like her. Why? Because affirmation helped her to become what she is. The power of blessing. Amen? My daughter, Faye, she is so favored by God. Every time she gets into a company, a whole company, in a matter of six months, she gets promoted. In less than a year, she gets promoted. Wherever she goes, you can be sure, in a short period of time, she'll be promoted. Okay? Once you begin to affirm people, you unleash their potential to become better people. You curse them, you disempower them. How do we... How do we treat our children? Do we bless them or do we curse them more? Okay? Biblical concept of the curse is the opposite of bless. The word arar in Hebrew means to degrade the worth or identity of another. Any word you say that degrades the identity or worth of another human being, according to the Bible, is arar, which means to curse. Any word. That you release, that degrades the worth of identity is to curse. The second meaning of curse, like bless, because of those degrading words, you cripple or weaken a person from succeeding or prospering. To cripple or weaken another from successfully fulfilling his or her unique purpose and potentials given by God. Every time you curse your spouse, you curse your children, you're going to make him worse. Because cursing cripples people. It degrades them. Their sense of worth is degraded. Any word that degrades another human being is a curse. You'll see that in a little while from the very lips of Jesus. A curse identity often leads to failure in destiny. The moment you curse your children, you're already guaranteeing they're going to struggle a lot. They may not even succeed in life. You just cripple them by your curses. You understand this? You will see this from the very lips of Jesus himself. Because curses and the resulting deep sense of shame they bring. Shame means the feeling of being rejected because of something wrong I did. Because of a wrong behavior, my whole being is rejected. The shame. The feeling of being rejected as a person because I just did something wrong. Did you get what shame means? The feeling of being rejected as a person simply because of something wrong I did. That's shame. Okay? Shame cripples our capacity for successful relationships and performance. Both of these are essential to the success of our destiny. They also deprive us of God's blessings and as much as our parents fail to bless us or pronounce God's blessing on our lives. Okay, we're soon going to answer how the blessing of Abraham is transferred from generation to generation. It's not automatic. You see, just as blessing empowers us to fulfill God's purpose for our lives, cursing cripples us from fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. How? Because cursing or dishonor cripples us in three ways. Number one, it damages our sense of self-worth and belongingness. When you feel rejected, you don't feel you belong. It leads us to reject, degrade, and despise ourselves. Right? That's why many people hate themselves so much. Because they've been cursed a lot by their own parents. Or by the teachers. You see, cursing diminishes our confidence and our capacity for doing and thereby in becoming. It, sur it suppresses our potentials as it builds barriers by instilling fear and insecurity in relationships and performance because we have been cursed. Wala kang kwenta, wala kang pupuntahan, sira ulo ka, gago, lahat na bobo, tanga, etc. Those words can kill. They can damage an entire future. And we'll see that in the very lips of Jesus. Take a look now at Matthew chapter 5. Can you read this with me? You have heard it was said to the people long ago, do not murder. That's the sixth commandment. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, what's the subject? What's the subject? The law on murder. 
Jesus now in chapter 5 is actually explaining the true essence of the law. He said, before you thought, if you kill a person physically, you broke the sixth command. No. Let me tell you this. That's more, it's more than that. Do not murder. It's more than what you think. Let me tell you what it means. If you are angry with your brother, you are a murderer. Because just like a murderer who will be subject to judgment, when you are angry with your brother, you will also be subject to judgment, just like a murderer. The word anger here, angry, is not the, the initial feeling of anger you feel when you're frustrated or whatever. It's vindictive anger. It's anger that wants to hurt another person. It's anger that wants to avenge oneself by doing to other person what he did to you. It's anger that makes you want to hurt another person. That's the anger mentioned here. So when you have vindictive anger, Jesus says you are no different from a murderer in God's eyes. More than that, if because of your anger you say to your brother, Raka in Aramaic, the language of Jesus, which really means good for nothing, Tagalog, wala kang kwenta, Jesus said, your, the seriousness and the gravity of your murder crime is the same as the one murderer who will be facing the Supreme Court. That's how serious it is. So once you say sa isang anak mo, asawa mo, wala kang kwenta o sa isang tao, sabi ni Jesus, wala kang pinakaiba sa isang murderer na harap sa Supreme Court in God's eyes. Or when you say to your person, you fool, ulul, G-A-G-O, T-A-N-G-O, Jesus said, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell itself. That's the worst. Any word that degrades the identity of worth or human being, Jesus said, is not only curse, it's a murder. So let me ask you tonight, sino hindi murderer dito? Sino hindi murderer dito? Pasalamat tayo, pwede tayo may ginantawat ang papatawa tayo kasi kamatayan ang katumbas niya niya. It is sinking into you that every time you say a degrading word to a person, you are in the eyes of God. You just committed murder. You just broke the sixth commandment. It's very serious. Once you curse another human being. In fact, James will emphasize this. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Did you hear that? Now, why did they say, who were made in God's likeness? Because it harks back to Genesis chapter 9. Okay? Actually, James here is interacting with what God said in James chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 9. Okay? Can you go to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6? God said to Noah, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by a man shall his blood be shed. Why should a man who kills also be killed? Because in the image of God, God has made man. In other words, any assault on any human being is an assault against the image of God, and therefore the punishment is death. This is where James got the idea. When you curse men, you are... These men are created in the image of God. You just murdered them by cursing them. Okay? Are you still there? That's what he's saying. Remember, Jesus said cursing is no different from murder. Same. Okay? But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So tell me, who is not a murderer here? Kaya pala yung mga anak natin, pag lumalaki, mga sira o gali. Asawa natin, lalo lumalala. Kaka-curse. E pinapatay pala natin sila eh. By cursing them. So you understand what curse is. 
Okay? Now let me tell you a story. And this is what's going to change your perspective completely. How many of you have heard of Craig Hill? Found founder of Family Foundations International, and uh, he seminars the ancient paths have gone all over the world and has transformed lives, including mine. Craig Hill was a pastor in a U.S. state, where his, in the state, there was a Jewish community there. He's been ministering to this church, been a lot of problems, marriage problems, rebellion of children, so many problems in the families of his Gentile church, Americans. And then he tried to reach out to a Jewish community in that state, and it is desire to win the Jews to Christ. And so he immersed himself in their, in their, in their families, in their synagogues. He spent time to with just to get to know the Jews, so they will feel comfortable with him when he shares the gospel, right? But as he involved himself in the community of the Jews, he began to become aware of the tremendous contrast that is sees between the quality of life of the Jews and the quality of life of Christians. You know what he discovered? He said in Jewish homes where he ministered, you will rarely hear parents cursing their children. In fact, he has not heard any curse of parents when they are being disciplined. He said, okay, go to your room but no word of curse. There's always a discipline, but no word of curse. And you notice that the families of the Jews are very, the solidarity is very strong. The bonding is very strong between parents and children, husband and wife, very strong bonding. In fact, there is no record of any divorce in the Jewish community. He looks at his church, a number of his couples are filing for divorce. There are problems of rebelling teenagers. He said, what? What's the secret of the Jews? Then he noticed also that every business that they start prospers. He hasn't found a Jew that's poor in that community. Everything the Jews start always prospers. In fact, that's already well known throughout the world among business people. The people are always amazed at the tremendous, uh, they call that the magic touch of a Jew. Anything he starts just prospers. He looks at his church, a lot are in financial debt, and a lot are in financial crisis. Businesses are not doing well. And so begin to ask, God, aren't Christians spiritual seed of Abraham and therefore heirs to the promise, as Paul said in Galatians 3? But why is it that the Jew seems to be experiencing more of the blessings of Abraham materially and in their family life, and I don't seem to see that in your church. He said, I know you're not a respecter of people, but these people rejected your son Jesus. And yet the blessings of Abraham are so obvious in their lives. And here are those who accept Jesus, your son, and they look more cursed. And so that started a journey of learning. He, he spent... You know, around two to three years studying the culture of the Jews. And after that period of time, he finally discovered what he calls the secret of the Jews. And you know what was the secret of the Jews? He discovered that Jewish culture is a culture of blessing. Every Jewish boy and girl is blessed by his father every Shabbat Friday evening after the meal, the father rises to bless his sons and his daughters. Every week of every month of every year throughout their growing years. You will never hear curses in a Jewish home. Never. Especially when they treat their children. You understand that? Okay? And not only that, he discovered at the seven critical times in a person's life, a Jew is blessed in those strategic, most critical moments of a person's life. Jews are blessed by their parents and by the community. Let's start with the first one. At the time of conception, you know, the family, relatives, and friends come to bless the mother and bless the child he or she carries in the womb. Remember Mary visiting Elizabeth? Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. That's what they do when somebody conceives. They bless the mother and they bless the son. Okay? 
Why is this important? Because a blessed conception is one that is wanted, accepted, and well received. The child inside feels accepted, welcome by the mother, by the parents, by the community. It occurs between two people in a covenant marriage relationship. If your child was born out of wedlock, that child is a curse. And we'll see more of that in actual counseling experiences. Any child born out of wedlock is outside of God's covenant of protection and blessing. Because God's promises of blessing and protection are only within the covenants that God establishes. Outside, there's no guarantee of divine protection or blessing outside the covenant. And because a child born outside of the marriage relationship, out of the covenant marriage, it's outside, it's not under God's protection or blessing. You understand that? Okay? In fact, you will soon see a scripture after the break that shows you any child born out of illegitimate relationship is a curse up to 10 generations. Okay, you'll be shocked. Okay? <laughs> yeah, that's why malimit, maraming problema doon sa panganay na pinanganak outside the marriage. Okay? That's why when a child is within the covenant, conceived within the covenant of marriage and it is blessed, that enables the, the child inside to feel accepted, well received and wanted and the child is born not out of lust but out of love because it's within the covenant of marriage do you understand that if you were born outside of, of your the marriage covenant of your parents before they got married there are possibilities because you're not under divine protection demonic powers moving around may see you and they can take advantage of that you're, you are not protected at all by God. And if you were chanced by a demonic power, you'll find yourself struggling with a lot of things that ordinary children don't struggle with as you grow up. You'll be a very problematic child. And you'll find yourself with a lot of compulsions and obsessions. It's not just a normal for a child of your age because something has already come inside because you're outside divine protection. Kung wala, you're, that's your, yes. It's important that the child is brought within a family where he is blessed by the parents who are in covenant, in the marriage covenant. That is very important for the child. The child must be brought into a common relationship, not only with Christ, but also with the family. Because the building of identity, the building of security comes from the parents, not from an orphanage. Orphanage cannot provide a strong sense of identity and security that children can receive only from their parents. Either their biological parents or their adopting parents. But so long as they're bound in the covenant of marriage, that's where the blessing of God moves. So when the parents bless the child, there is power there to release the child from cur the curse. Okay, mahabang kwentuan but we will go there soon. Okay, so during conception, they are blessed. From the moment you were conceived in your mother's womb, you are blessed. This conception is one that is not wanted, accepted, or well received. It is resented as an intrusion into the lives of the parents because they are not prepared for the child. Yung mga bata na yan na kulang na lang i-abort, ni-reject, paglaki niyan, problematic yan. Na-curse sila from the womb eh. They are cursed from the womb. Nakapasok ng demonyo doon. Okay, that's why when parents resent the coming of a child, mahirapan sila sa batang yan, taglaki, the curse. It may occur outside marriage and as a result of lust also. That's also a cursed conception. But again, that child can still be redeemed. If there will be parents, either yung, yung mother and biological father may got married later on and they bless the child. And that can still be undo the effects of the curse upon the child's life. Okay? Again, you will have questions there. Let me finish first so you can see the whole picture. Okay? Pregnancy. At the moment, during those six, nine months of pregnancy, relatives, friends will come, give gifts, and bless the mother and the child for nine months. Why is that important? Because then those nine months are very critical for the fetus. Any problem that takes place in those nine months can 
drastically affect the future of the child. That's why the Jews know that. That's why they come and bless the child all throughout this thing. They bless talaga yan to protect the child. Okay? So pregnancy, a blessed pregnancy is one that is wanted, accepted, and received. There is a lack of emotional stress and turmoil because the mother and the father love the child. The child experiences nurturing and love from the mother. The child's arrival is greatly anticipated. Ima kina ko si Bihoy, baby. Alam mo, that affects the child. If you're wanted, accepted, and anticipated. Okay? The third is birth. The moment a child is born, that's a cause for community celebration. Again, the people will come, look at the child who just came the world, and look, look at it. It looks like his daddy. God bless you, and bless, may the blessings of Abraham be upon you. May you become like David. May you become like you know a, a great man in the Bible. Kung lalaki kung babae, may you be like Leah or Rachel. Usually, a blessing for babae. Okay, a blessed birth is one where the sex or gender of the child is received as a gift from God. Sana naging babae ka. Patay, nasumpa yung bata, kalalabas lang sa mundo. Okay? And it's not a disappointment that the child is male or female. The child is received, loved, nurtured by both parents. The, the birth process is free from trauma because the child has been blessed throughout the months of pregnancy. <laughs> the birth process was extra special in Jewish culture. Not only was the family excited, so was the community. The parents prayed over the child and asked God for the name of the child. They understood that the church destiny, the child's destiny, was in that name. Since they would be saying that name hundreds of times, they wanted to be speaking destiny over the child each time they called the child by name. Yep, yung pinangalang yung anak. Ano yung pangalan na binagay sa isang anak na pinanganak ng ano? Mga pangit na mga pangalan. Gusto na tayo, anak na lumaki na ganun eh. Because that is a word you will hear all your life. The Jews want to be sure that that word is a word of blessing. So every time their name is called, they are blessed and affirmed. Okay, that's why Jews are very comfortable about the names they give to their children. The name was given in a ceremony on the eighth day during the circumcision if it's a boy. And that's what happened also to Jesus. He had the name Jesus after he was circumcised. Do you understand that? Okay. The next critical stage is infancy. The growing years from childbirth to age 13. Infancy and childhood. A blessed infancy or childhood is one where the child is accepted, loved, and nurtured. The child is breastfed and close bonding with the mother occurs. The father shows physical affection and bonding relationship with the child. The child is blessed regularly by the father, the Jewish blessing of children by the father on the eve of the Sabbath every week. When applying correction and discipline, parents separate identity and behavior and do not curse the child in their correction of the child's behavior. You see, when the Jews discipline the child, they only focus on the behavior. They don't attack the child's identity. They apply consequences for bad behavior, but they never curse the child. Never. Okay? That's why the child develops a very healthy sense of identity in the family because of the affirmation of the father every week. And discipline focuses only on the behavior, not the identity of the child. The child develops a very positive view of himself. Okay? The child is affirmed throughout those years of childhood. When the child feels rejected or cursed in the early stages, conception, pregnancy, birth, infancy, and childhood, the potential result is that the child continues to live with deep feelings of rejection, depression, fear, lust, irrational anger, guilt, shame, and self-contempt. Very common. Characteristics of children who went through cursed conceptions, cursed pregnancies, cursed birth, or cursed infancy and childhood. Then the effect of sabata psychologically and spiritually okay five puberty at the age of 13 for a boy age of 12 for a jewish girl that is the most important turning point in a jewish child's life because during that time at the age of 13 for boys age of 12 for girls they go through a ceremony called the bar mitzvah 
of the bat mitzvah. We will see that in a little while. A blessed puberty is one where both parents can separate identity from behavior in dealing with the child's misbehaviors as he or she engages in the psychological and emotional struggles of his developing teenage life. Yung bang, alam mo, pag ikaw going through teenage life, marami kang changes na nararamdaman eh. And you want to think for yourself, make decisions. If your parents are very cursing on you because of that, you're damaged. You're going to be completely damaged. Because the parents do not recognize your need to grow and develop. Okay? And so, when they deal with behavior, with your, you only deal with the wrong behavior, okay, because you did that, you have no allowance next week, Sean. Okay? And because you did that, you're grounded from the computer for one week. So they deal with the behavior, but they never curse the child. Never. Okay? And not only that, uh, okay, the parents show understanding for the struggles of the teenager as he goes through many psychological, emotional, and physical changes during the time. They're very understanding. Okay? The relationship between the child and parents facilitates a free sharing of feelings and emotions. Don't talk to me! Filipino culture. Jewish parents say, they will allow their children to reason with them. Because it's the only way the parent can know what's going on in the mind of the child by letting him speak. So the parent now can correctly apply the right corrective because he knows what the child is thinking. If you never allow your children to speak, you don't know where they are, you judge them a lot of times, you don't even know what's going on, and one day, they rebel. Why? Because they never felt you understood them. You're always judging them all the time. They should never listen. Right? Yeah, when the, when the father fails to fulfill his role as a leader, that's when the family begins to break down. When the wife tries to take the role of a father, that adds also to the breakdown, although the intention of the wife is very well, because he wants to really maintain order in the family. And because the husband cannot do it, so the wife tries to do it. But in the process, the more the man is put down, and the more the children uh, lose respect for the father, and sometimes for the parents, and that's why discipline becomes very difficult. Because when children lose their respect for the parents, parental discipline will not be that effective anymore. And it can become, uh, in the extreme, the parents will become so frustrated to become abusive. And that adds to the damage in the children. It's really a vicious cycle. Once the father does not do his job, everything else falls. Means everything is affected. So, relationship between the child and parents facilitates a free sharing of feelings and emotions. So long as the, I always told my children when they were younger, I allow you to speak if you will do it with respect. But if you don't speak in respect, you have lost my ears. So I'm not, if I'm correcting you, I, I expect you to tell me what's in your heart, what's in your mind. Okay? So I will know where they are. Because we mga parents, to be honest, we are always judgmental sa bata. We always think we know everything. That is our biggest fallacy. And that's why we are abusive of our children, because we think we know everything. You never know it until you talk with their child because you don't know exactly what happened during the time you were outside. Or if you were witness to what happened, at least you are more confident you know what's going on. But sometimes you cannot read the intentions of your child's heart until you talk to your child. Remember how God dealt with Adam and Cain? He asked them questions. He processed them first before he condemned them. Pero tayo kuminsan, condemn mo na, saka too late na yung processing. Yung pala, pala pa, kumali pala, hindi pala ito, may kasalanan yung isa. Patay, eh, genudge mo na agad eh. Kasi you did not investigate first. Ano ba talaga nangyari? So that's why our biggest mistake as parents is to think we know everything. That's a big lie. We don't know everything about our children. Okay? We always presume we know our children until something bad happens and we're shocked. How could my son do that? You see, you really did not know your son. Okay? Because when, when, when you have a very suppressive home, I will see that in the other one, suppressive home. Your children will never be themselves inside the house because they're scared. Their true color will never come out because they're suppressed. Malabas yun sa school, sa barkada. And you'll just be shocked. Gano'n yung anak ko? Why? Because you never knew your child. Because you never gave them the chance to express themselves. You don't know really what's going on in their hearts. You don't know what's going on in their minds. You don't know the pain they're going through. Because you never listen to them. You only, you know, 
keep condemning them all the time. And you think they're okay, and one day you're shocked. You understand this? Don't presume you know your children. Most parents don't. Let me tell you that from experience. Until you hear your children, until you know what's going on in their life, until you spend time to talk with them, listen to what they're saying, you can never say you know your children. You may presume, but you will be wrong. You'll be shocked one day. Okay? Puberty. The father during puberty, the Jewish father, provides blessing and acceptance which enables the child to move from needing the mother's bonding into a more responsible adult role. The child is initiated by the parents and community into his or her adult destiny through the ceremony called the Jewish Bar Mitzvah. This is where a boy becomes a man. And is now challenged to take adult roles in the community at the age of 13. Okay, and the manhood or the womanhood is blessed and released by the parents over the child during the ceremony. Security in becoming adult is established. So the father would say, you are my son and I am pleased with you. I am proud of you. And you are like this and the father affirms the son and he starts blessing the son. Okay, so there's affirmation, there's impartation during the bar mitzvah. Same with the daughter. The parents also affirm and then impart blessing on the girl. And here we find that the woman is released into manhood. This is when the father releases his boy to become a man. So a boy will, a Jewish man knows the day when he became a man. In our culture, we don't have that. In our culture, the woman knows when she became a woman. But the man knows. That's a problem. That's why our men are, tend to be more boys than men. Because I never understood what manhood is. Ed Cole said, author Maximize Manhood, founder of Christian Men's Network in the U.S., he said, becoming male is a matter of birth. Becoming a man is a matter of choice. And until the father teaches the child what it takes to be a man, this boy will never become a man. Because he doesn't know. When did he become a man? Circumcision? No way. Barkada? It got worse. We have no proper initiation of female Filipino boys into manhood. Every Jewish boy goes through that at the age of 13. He knows that that day he became a man. And he's expected to take on the qualities of a man from the age 13 onwards. That's why this, these Jewish men are very confident, they're very strong. That's why they prosper in whatever they do because their potentials are unleashed because of the blessing of parents all throughout their growing years. They're being blessed by their parents. That's why Jewish culture is so blessed. Because it's a culture of blessing. Do you understand that? Okay. The experience of rejection or lack of a father's love in puberty can result in rebellion, deep sense of insecurity with, with oneself that can affect relationships and performance, sometimes gender confusion, that's where effeminate, homosexual, retention of identity with the mother, that means a boy still becomes dependent on the mom, naging mama's boy, naging more feminish, or lifelong unrest in the soul and quest to find or prove one's worth and identity because the father failed to affirm the identity of the child at this age. At the age of 13, a father will present his son to the congregation, to the community and say, this is my beloved son. Identity is established in the child. This day, you are a man. And that's why the father, the Jewish Jewish father, you know, longs for the day when he will say this prayer. Baruch Hashem Ha'adunai. Blessed be thou, O Lord, our God, that this day you have released me from all responsibility over the decisions of the son of mine. From this day onward. The son, at the age of 13 onwards, becomes completely responsible for his obedience or disobedience of God's law because that day he becomes a son of the law, bar mitzvah. That from now on, parents can no longer be blamed by God for any de wrong decision the child makes. The father has mentored him all throughout his growing years in the Torah, in the law. At the age of 13, he's now responsible to obey the law. He becomes a son of the law or a doer of the law. And whatever he disobeys that, the father is not responsible anymore. Age 13 onwards. Yes. So that's puberty. And then the next stage is marriage. Marriage is very critical because 
you know, the first years of marriage will determine whether you're going to be for life together or not. Okay, that's why the Jews are very careful that they bless the couple during their marriage. A blessed marriage is one where the son or daughter is blessed by parents in marriage. Never get married if both parents from both sides are not going to bless it. You're entering a lot of risks. The parents and the of, and the son daughter are in agreement about the marriage partner and the timing of the wedding the wedding is attended and blessed by both sets of parents very important for their life together is the blessing of parents and the communities one week they celebrate the marriage feast and for one week the community blesses them to prepare them for their life together as a family and the final okay a lack, the lack of blessing from parent a parent or parents creates a bondage in the soul with that parent or those parents because it will be bitterness you know disappointment a root of bitterness or guilt that broken soul tie will keep the married person from functioning successfully in his or her marriage as the bitterness or guilt with the parents will damage relationships with the spouse and children due to unrest in the soul caused by a cursed identity and desire to prove one's worth in the family relationship because the parents rejected the blessing for the marriage. Okay? That is why never enter marriage without the blessing of both parents. You're facing a lot of risks. If you are not blessed by the parents, the parental blessing is very important to your married life. Okay? So, old age. Do you know that among Jewish homes, wala ka makikita ng Jewish grandma, grandpa na malungkot, na depressed, araw-araw? Because when you become a senior citizen, you usually live in the house of your son. And every day, the grandchildren will rise up to bless the grandpa and the grandma. Every day. Ano malulungkot nun? And the son and, and daughter usually bless their parents regularly. It's really a culture of blessing. A blessed older age is one where the children regularly bless their parents later in life. This completes the cycle of blessing. A lack of blessing from children or grandchildren in one's advanced years leads to deep feelings of loneliness, abandonment, rejection, failure, and resentment. Okay, let's talk about Filipino culture. How does it look like compared to Jewish culture? Seems to be quite the opposite. If Jewish culture is a culture of blessing, I no wonder Israel remains a great nation to this day. And Filipino culture is a culture of cursed identities. Now we know why our nation is like this today. We're a culture of cursed identities. And everything begins in the home. It is obvious that a person raised with his blessings would have solid roots of identity and a sense of being wanted, accepted, and worthwhile, and not have a sense of being abandoned or rejected. A child who is loved, accepted, and wanted would have a healthy image of himself. He would not need to perform to gain acceptance or to prove personal value. That is, he won't develop an unhealthy performance drive to prove his worth or gain acceptance from others. Life can be spent being the unique person he was created to be and developing into what he was meant to become. A child raised in that environment would not fear, resent, or avoid correction. Correction would be seen as a way to keep him on track with a blessing and train him for his destiny. That's the power of a culture of blessing in the family. I've seen that in my children. When we started the culture of blessing in our family, to me, the greatest family in the world is my family. I'm proud of all of them. Okay? Because we've been blessing them through the past years, we have seen how God's favor has never left them. And uh, I'm saying this with tr in truth and humility. My children, they never look for jobs. I mean, they, they, they don't look for hard for a job. A job always finds them. The favor of God, we can see that in our children. It's so wonderful to see that. Sabi nga sa kanila, mo mahirap yung maghabol sa pera eh. Mas maganda pag yung hapera ko mahabos sa iyo, yung Abrahamic blessing. Eh, ganun yung kanilang karinasan. Kasi nga, marating talaga sa kanila. Without really struggling hard to find a job. Why? Because they build excellence in their lives. Because they are blessed. Amen?
We always make them believe you can do it. We believe in their gifts and their potentiality. We affirm that in them. And uh, we're not perfect. There are times we make mistakes too. But in general, we have found ourselves blessing our children all the more in these past years. <clears throat> That's why God has never stopped to bless them. Look at Israel. Genesis 31:55. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and... 1 Chronicles 16.43, then all the people left, each for his own home, and look what David does whenever he comes home. Whenever he comes home, he blesses his family. Genesis 27.33, Isaac said regarding Jacob, his son, when Esau came and said, don't you have any blessing for me? Because he remember, Jacob stole the blessing because of the tandem uh, crime with, the, with his mother who plotted the deception of his own, her own husband, uh, Isaac. I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. Now listen to this. Here you will find that the blessings of Abraham do not come to the children automatically. The father must release the blessing. And because he blessed Jacob, who was not the firstborn, you cannot change that anymore. Once the father speaks the blessing, heaven has already registered that. And I have blessed him, Esau. And indeed he will be blessed. But I'm sorry. I've given him the blessing. I cannot give it to you anymore. You understand that? So Esau does not inherit the blessing of Abraham automatically. It has to be pronounced by the father. The blessing of Abraham transmitted through the generations through the father or the parent imparting the blessing to the child. That is why you see the Jews, they bless their children. David blesses his family every time he comes home. Because that's important. The authority of the Father empowers him to impart the blessing to the next generation by his pronouncements. You understand that? But look at Filipino culture. We've been cursing, cursing, cursing. And we wonder why our nation is like this. It's all there in the family. Everything started with the family. Okay, Genesis 49, 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father, Jacob, said to them, and he blessed them, giving us the blessing appropriate to him, based on the needs, based on the potentials, based on the prospect he sees on each of his son, he blesses him accordingly. Because Jacob recognizes to each son, God has different, given a different destiny, a different purpose, and God has given a different blend of potentials. And so the father's job is to look at those potentials and affirm that and see the future based on and begin to bless the child to fulfill those potentials according to God's purpose. The blessing for the child must be according, appropriate to the child. And there's some based on the needs and based on the potentials you see in the child. Okay? And then Mark 10, 13 to 16, you know, parents wanted Jesus to bless their children. Okay? I mean, I'm sure the fathers were blessing them, but to be blessed by a great rabbi, or for them, the Messiah, was the greatest blessing of all. And they don't want their children to miss that blessing. And so the, they wanted Jesus to bless their children, and the disciples, you know, stopped them because they see Jesus is tired. But Jesus is never tired enough to bless children. He's never tired because he knows once he pronounces that blessing, it's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. And he will not miss that opportunity to bless the children. You understand that? He took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. Okay? And then, Moses blesses the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the blessing in which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death. Notice identity there and blessing. The, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned from Serapanas. He shone from the Mount Paran. He came from the tent of thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Yes, he loved his people. That's affirmation. All his holy ones were in his hands, so they followed in your steps, receiving direction from you. And then he blesses each of the tribes by name. And then after blessing all the tribes, he affirms them again. Sorry, this is all messed up. Okay? 
The eternal God is your dwelling place, security, the blessing of security. And underneath are the everlasting arms. That's a lot of security. And he thrust out the enemy before you and said, destroy them. He gives them victory over their enemies. That's empowering. That's impartation. So Israel live in safety. Jacob live alone in the land of grain and wine. That's abundance, prosperity, whose heavens drop down dew. God blesses them with the assurance of prosperity. Happy are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. That's identity. The shield of your help and the sword of your triumph. God gives you victory over your enemies. That's blessing of impartation. Your enemies shall come falling to you, and you shall tread upon their backs. That's, again, the blessing of God empowering them to overcome their enemies. That is blessing. Impart affirmation, impartation. Okay?